Section 6 of The Magic of the Horseshoe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc Dio Martin. The Magic of the Horseshoe by Robert Means Lawrence. The Magic of the Horseshoe, Part 6. 17. The Horseshoe as a Symbol on Tavern Signboards. The horseshoe, associated usually with some other symbol, is not infrequently seen displayed on the signs of British taverns. There is a well-known hostelry bearing this sign and name on Tottenham Court Road in London. To quote from The History of Signboards by Jacob Larwood and John Camden Houghton, the three horseshoes are not uncommon, and the single shoe may be met with in many combinations arising from the old belief in its lucky influences. Thus, the horse and horseshoe was the sign of William Warden at Dover, as appears from his token. The sun and horseshoe is still a public house sign in Great Titchfield Street, and the magpie and horseshoe may be seen carved in Fetter Lane. The magpie is perched within the horseshoe, a bunch of grapes being suspended from it. The horns and horseshoe is represented on the token of William Grange in Gutter Lane, 1666, a horseshoe within a pair of antlers. The hoop and horseshoe on Tower Hill was formerly called the horseshoe. Miller Christie, in his book, The Trade Signs of Essex, says that horseshoe signs probably own their origin partly to the fact that this symbol appears on the arms of the farrier's company and partly to the old practice of fastening a horseshoe upon the stable door or elsewhere as a witch scare in the county of essex the horseshoe may be seen upon the signs of beer houses at great parndon braintree waltham abbey and high ongar there was formerly more than one noted inn in London known as the Half Moon, and a street of that name leading from Piccadilly is well known. The name and symbol of the full moon, however, seldom appear on signboards. Butler asks in Hudibras, Tell me, but what's the natural cause? Why on a sign no painter draws the full moon but the half? The reason is doubtless because of the favorable auspices associated from time immemorial with the crescent moon. One need hardly accept as plausible the explanation sometimes offered, namely, that the half-moon tavern symbol is a silent invitation to eat and drink to one's full capacity, a hint, as it were, to follow the crescent moon's example and get full. 18 horseshoes on church doors the origin of the horseshoe as a charm has been ascribed to its resemblance to the metallic aureole or meniscus formerly placed over the heads of images of patron saints in churches and which is also represented in ancient pictures of the virgin this aureole or more properly nimbus was probably of pagan origin for in early times circles of stars frequently ornamented the heads of statues of the gods as emblematic of divinity in speaking of certain ancient relics found in ireland mr w g wood martin pagan ireland page four hundred ninety two says thin crescentic plates with the extremities terminating in flat circular discs are the ornaments most frequently discovered in form they are identical with the half moon shaped ornaments in use among the greeks and romans and with the nimbi on carvings of the byzantine school and they differ but little from the ring which now is conventionally placed around the head of a saint thus this glory can be traced back to pagandom the crescentic plate appears to have been primarily the badge of some distinguished person, a chief or king. Then it became the emblem of one considered to be a very holy person, for in Ireland, in the early days of Christianity, the saints were derived principally from the aristocracy. 
in the collection of the Royal Irish Academy is a golden tiara or diadem said to have been found in County Clare. This relic, which measures about a foot in height and the same in breadth, is thought to have been a headdress of some pagan or early Christian chieftain. In the earlier years of the church, these crescent symbols were avoided as savoring of heathenism, but without any thought of its significance, it became customary in the Middle Ages to place a circular brass plate upon the heads of statues as a protection from snow or rain. Hence arose the practice of similarly adorning images and paintings in churches. In later times, these crescent-shaped pieces of metal were sometimes nailed up at the entrance of churches and so came to be regarded as protective emblems. The horseshoe was an easily available substitute for the halo or glory and so was often placed upon the doors of churches especially in the southwest of England, as it was generally believed in olden times that evil spirits could enter even consecrated edifices. Aubrey, in his Miscellanies, mentions having seen under the porch of Stannonfield Church in Suffolk an inscription with the device of a horseshoe intended to exclude witches and he naively remarks that one would imagine holy water amply sufficient for the purpose. On the south door of the parish church of Ashby Fauville in Leicestershire were formerly two ancient horseshoes of great size, one of them measuring sixteen by eleven and a half inches, or more than twice as large as an average modern shoe. As it does not seem likely that such shoes were made to fit horses' feet, in the absence of traditional information regarding them, it appears probable that they were intended solely to bar the ingress of witches. In St. Martin's Church, Canterbury, the oldest in England, the sacristan shows visitors the site of an early English door on the south side and a Norman doorway in the middle of the northern wall, both long since blocked up. Infants to be baptized were formerly brought into the church by the south entrance, and after the ceremony the north door was thrown open to permit the egress of evil spirits expelled by baptism. For in early times demons were believed to come from the north, where the habitations of the north's gods were also thought to be. The pagans, when worshipping their deities, looked towards the north, but Christians engaged in prayer turned their faces eastward and lifted up their hands. They regarded the north as the unblessed heathen quarter. The unexplored Arctic regions where night reigned much of the time were thought to belong especially to the devil or spirit of darkness, and the same idea is conveyed in several passages of Holy Scripture as, for example, in Jeremiah 4, 6, I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. In the Middle Ages, the rose windows in the north and south transepts of Lincoln Minster were called the two eyes of the cathedral, the former being known as the Dean's Eye, ever on the watch against the attacks of Lucifer, who had his abode in the sides of the north. Isaiah fourteen thirteen. While the window in the south transept was called the bishop's eye, courting the influence of the Holy Spirit, of which the south wind was a type. Apropos of evil spirits entering consecrated places, there is a quaint legend about a little stone figure, eclipsed the Lincoln imp which is to be seen perched upon a corbel of a column on the north side of the angel choir of the same cathedral. According to one version of the legend, when Bishop Remigius came to Lincoln in the year after the Norman conquest, the devil was sorely tried, for until that time he had had undisturbed control of affairs in the town and neighborhood. In vain, the evil one sought to hinder the completion of the church and finally he waylaid the bishop outside the building and attempted to kill him. 
But the good bishop at this critical time called upon the Blessed Virgin Mary for assistance, and she sent a tempest of wind, which so buffeted and distracted the devil that he sought refuge inside the church, not daring to venture out because of the fierce wind, which prevails a good part of the time even nowadays, and which is still awaiting the devil's reappearance. The bishop we know died long ago. The wind still waits, nor will he go till he has a chance of beating his foe. But the devil hopped up without a limp, and at once took shape as the Lincoln imp, and there he sits atop the column, and grins at the people who gaze so solemn. Moreover, he mocks at the wind below, and says, You may wait till doomsday, oh. In southern Germany, Bavaria, and Tyrol, the horseshoe symbol is to be seen on church doors as an emblem of St. Leonard, the guardian and protector of horses and travelers, and it is usually associated with some romantic legend, having oftentimes a historic basis. Traditions relating to horseshoes on church doors are, indeed, plentiful in the popular literature of Germany, and a few examples are given later. St. Leonard's Day, November 6th, had its special observances. The peasants were wont to bring their horses to some church dedicated to that worthy and ride them thrice around the sacred building, a procedure which was believed to be highly auspicious. It was, moreover, customary for noblemen, before starting on an equestrian journey, to fasten a horseshoe on the church door as a votive offering to St. Leonard. A special honor is accorded to this saint on the day of his festival at Fischhausen, a seaport village in northeastern Prussia. On that occasion, the parish church is surrounded by farm wagons and other vehicles drawn by gaily decorated horses, for here the country people have a grand rendezvous. Young women in holiday attire drive hither the cows, who have been brought from their summer quarters in the upland pastures, that they too may participate in the festivities. A religious service, largely attended by the peasants, is first held in the church, and then follow the outdoor exercises, of which a chief feature consists in driving the horses three times around the building at a rapid pace. During the prevalence of a severe episodic in Württemberg many years ago, the people removed the shoes from their horses' feet and hung them on the walls of churches as propitiatory offerings. Various other iron implements, such as chain traces, were thus similarly displayed. An ancient St. Leonard's Chapel in the town of Laupheim is encircled by an iron chain which is said to have been forged from horseshoes thus piously contributed the largest church dedicated to this saint is at Tuls in upper bavaria and its altar is likewise surrounded by an iron chain pictures of saint leonard are sometimes placed upon stable doors to bring luck he is usually represented as holding a pastoral staff while on one side is seen a colt or filly on the other a sick ox and at his feet is a ewe lamb in northern Germany, St. George, as a successor of Woden, is one of the special guardians and protectors of horses. On the festal day of this saint, April 23rd, the peasants gather in large numbers around some church dedicated to him, and their horses and vehicles, numbering sometimes many hundreds, are drawn up in a circle around the sanctuary. After the parish priest has delivered a sermon in the church, he comes to the door and blesses each horse separately as the animal is led past, meanwhile sprinkling him with holy water. Then the young men mount their best horses and ride them three times at full speed around the church, shouting lustily, meanwhile. Gaines remarks that this ceremony is doubtless a relic of some pagan rite, and that in many places a venerable tree instead of a Christian church is chosen as the place of rendezvous on St. George's Day. During the ride around the tree, an aged peasant, standing in its shade, throws upon each horse, as it passes, 
a little moist earth taken from about the roots of the sacred tree, and this ensures the animal against sickness until the following spring, especially if some of the earth be placed in a bag and hung up in the stable. As the hammer was Thor's emblem, so the horseshoe has been thought to possess a certain mystic significance as a symbol of the heathen god Woden, and it has been assumed that the ancient churches, upon whose doors horseshoes are still to be seen, were built upon the sites of pagan temples dedicated to that deity. It has been argued, moreover, that the modern use of a horseshoe as a talisman and the placing of horses' heads on peasants' houses are relics of heathendom and have a mysterious affinity with the hoofprint legends of Teutonic mythology. Such a theory appears plausible enough in view of the fact that many of the superstitious customs and beliefs of modern times are known to have existed before the Christian era. 19. Horseshoe Legendary Lore 1. Within recent years, two horseshoes were to be seen on the door of the parish church of Hackham in Derbyshire. A romantic legend associated with these horseshoes is the theme of a ballad supposed to have been written by a master of Exeter Grammar School in the early part of the 19th century. The ballad graphically describes a race for a wager between a certain Earl of Totnes mounted on a Derbyshire roan and one Sir Arthur Champernoun on a fleet Barbary courser. The race was won by the Earl, who thereupon rode straight to the door of Hackham Church, and there he fell on his knees and prayed, and many an Ava Maria said, Bread and money he gave to the poor and he nailed the roan's shoes to the chapel door. 2. In the traditionary lore of the Hartz Mountains, there is a weird tale of four horseshoes, which for ages were to be seen on the door of a church in the suburbs of Cledenburg. Once upon a time, so runs this story, a great drinking match was held on a Sunday morning at Elrich. The prize was a golden chain, and many knights assembled from near and far. The carousel lasted for some hours until Count Ernest of Klettenberg, the only one who could still keep on his feet, exultantly claimed the golden chain, which he hung about his neck. Then, mounting his horse, he rode homeward, and while nearing Klettenberg, he heard the strains of evensong in a church dedicated to St. Nicholas. Urging on his steed, he rode madly through the open door straight to the altar, then, so runs the legend, the horse's four shoes fell off, and horse and rider sank down together out of sight. In memory of this wonderful event, the four horseshoes were placed on the door of the church, and for many years were regarded with awe by the simple country folk. 3. In the construction of the Church of St. Stephen at Tangermunda in Prussian Saxony, a brick edifice of the 14th century, the members of two guilds, those of the blacksmiths and shoemakers, were of a special assistance, and in remembrance of this, a horseshoe and an iron shoe sole were built into the outer wall of the church. The former indicates that up to its level the blacksmiths had built the walls and the latter shows that all the work above the horseshoe was done by the shoemakers. Such, at least, is the popular explanation, which may well be received, cum grano solus. 4. In the parish church of Schwarzenstein in East Prussia hang two horseshoes as reminders of the following tradition. In the village of Eichmedian, one mile from Rustenburg, lived formerly as tavern keeper a woman who had earned an unenviable notoriety by her practice of charging double the proper fees for board and lodging. Late one night, when several of her guests accused her of being a cheat, she asseverated her honesty by holding up her hand and saying in the form of an oath, If my score is not correct, may the devil now jump on my back. The evil one took the woman promptly at her word, transformed her into a mare, and rode her out of the village, laughing scornfully. At headlong speed, he rode to a blacksmith's shop in Schwarzenstein and demanded that his mare be shot at once. The blacksmith, routed out of his sleep, excused himself, 
pleading the lateness of the hour and the fact that there was no fire in his forge. The devil insisted, however, and promised liberal payment if the work were done quickly. The blacksmith yielded at length, but had not proceeded far in shaping the shoes when the mare began to speak. My cousin, don't you know me? she said. I am the tavern keeper. Upon this, the blacksmith was so horrified that neither threats nor entreaties could prevail to make him proceed with the shoeing, and before he had finished the third shoe, a cock crowed, and immediately the spell was broken and the woman reassumed her own form. And to point the moral of this legend, and as a warning to cheats, the two horseshoes which the smith had completed were nailed up in the village church at Schwarzenstein. 5. According to an old tradition, the Lap King, Olaf Skrtkenen, 995 to 1030, wishing to become a Christian, asked his royal contemporary, Ethelred II of England, to send him a teacher. In response to this request, Bishop Siegfried and three missionaries came to Sweden and, landing on the southwestern coast, encamped the first night at Wexio on Lake Sodre. Here the bishop saw in a vision a great company of angels and thereupon determined to build a church at that place. The pagan inhabitants, however, were hostile to the undertaking and seized the three missionaries, Winaman, Unaman, and Sunaman, whom they beheaded and caused their heads to be thrown into the water. One night soon after this sad event, Siegfried was walking along the shore of the lake, sighing and praying, when he espied three luminous objects approaching on the water, borne onward by the waves, and soon he recognized them as the heads of his friends. And behold, the first head said, The dead shall be avenged and a voice from the second head exclaimed, When? Then replied the third head, in solemn tones, On their children and children's children. This prophecy was not, however, fulfilled to the letter, for through Siegfried's intercession, Olaf consented to spare the lives of the murderers, on condition that they should build a Christian church in Wexio, and this church, which still exists, has on its coat of arms or seal the representation of three severed heads in memory of the occurrence and its legend. In this church hung formerly a shoe of Woden's famous steed, Sleipnir, as a souvenir of the following tradition. When the church bells rang for the first time to summon the people to Mass, Woden came riding over the mountains, and, when nearing Wexio, Sleipnir, in a sudden fright, struck a rock with one of his feet and the impress of the powerful blow remains in the rock to this day but the shoe fell off and was placed in this church six many years ago so runs an old legend a man obtained employment at a farm in norway where unknown to him the mistress was a witch although the man had plenty of good wholesome food he did not thrive upon it but became thinner each day being troubled at this, he sought the counsel of a wise man, from whom he learned the true character of his mistress. He learned, moreover, that she had been in the habit of transforming him into a horse at night while he slept, and riding him to Trom's church, a fact which fully accounted for his leanness. The wise man also gave him a magical ointment with which to rub his head at bedtime, and by virtue of which, on awaking the next morning, he found himself standing by Trom's church with a bridle in his hand, while behind him were a number of horses bound together by their tails. Soon he perceived his mistress coming out of the church, and when she was near enough to him, he threw the bridle over her head and instantly she was transformed into a handsome mare, which he mounted and rode homeward. On his way, however, he stopped at a farrier's and had the animal shod with four new shoes, and on reaching home he told his master that he had bought a fine mare that would be an excellent mate for one which he already had. His master bought the mare at a good price, but when he took the bridle off she disappeared, and in her place stood the mistress witch with new horseshoes on her hands and feet. Thereupon the man related the wonderful tale of his experiences, 
and in consequence thereof the wife was turned out of doors and never got rid of the horseshoes. 7. Once upon a time a gentleman of rank was driving with four horses along the highway which runs between the towns of Tübingen and Herschau in Württemberg, and when, opposite a roadside chapel, he scoffed at a picture of the Madonna which adorned it. Immediately his horses came to a standstill, nor could he make them proceed, in spite of vigorous urging. At length, in this dilemma, a priest was called, who imposed as a penance the removal of a shoe from the right forefoot of each horse, and after this had been done the gentleman was enabled to continue his journey. And in commemoration of this miracle, one of the horseshoes was nailed upon the chapel door, where it was still to be seen in recent years. 8. One Sunday morning, a swarthy rider on a black horse rode at full speed through the village of Naburg in Bavaria, directly to the blacksmith's shop to have his horse shod. Will you not rest on a Sunday? demanded the smith. My steed and I journey to and fro and care nothing for the Christian Sunday, replied the horseman. Therefore, shoe my horse in the devil's name, and I counsel thee speak no pious word meanwhile for no devout person has yet obtained the mastery over this spirited animal. With these words he sprang to the ground and stroked his horse's flowing mane. The smith, though ill at ease, began the work, and the horse was as quiet as if under a spell, much to the astonishment of his master, who could scarce believe his eyes. Three shoes were quickly set, and the smith called to his assistant, now then in god's name hand me the last shoe instantly the fiery steed reared and struck out wildly casting a shoe with such force against the wall that it remains to this day embedded there but the horse and his rider were seen no more nine in a wall on an estate called Ludwigstein in Schleswig-Holstein is to be seen a large stone bearing the imprint of a horseshoe wherewith is associated the following tale. One morning many years ago, a horseman was riding along the road when the church prayer bell rang, whereupon he swore an oath and said, May the devil take me if I am not again on this very spot this evening when the bell again sounds. And indeed he kept his word. But at the stroke of the evening bell, his horse slipped upon the stone and broke a leg, and the mark of a shoe is still to be seen there. Ten. The horseshoe imprint in the cemetery of the Church of Our Lady at Munster. During the building of this beautiful Gothic church in the 14th century, the devil observed its shapely proportions with increasing displeasure, and bethought himself of various schemes to hinder the work's progress. Finally, he decided on trying to bewitch the architect's senses. Accordingly, he braided his hair, arrayed himself in gay female attire, bedecked with costly jewels, and appeared before the architect, whom he sought to ensnare with soft words and gifts. But the latter was not thus to be deceived. Leaning upon his measuring rod, he listened unmoved to the beguiling conversation of the pretended bell, and rejected with scorn the gold and precious stones which she brought him. Thereupon the devil became enraged stamped upon the ground with vehemence and disappeared leaving behind him an evil smell and the mark of one of the iron horseshoes wherewith he was shod was deeply imprinted on a stone in the cemetery and according to popular report is still to be found there the impressions on stone of figures of horseshoes of which there are numerous examples in northern europe are regarded by some archaeologists as sacred symbols of the pagans or relics of the cult of woden and as showing the sites of ancient altars and burial places while others maintain that these figures were originally intended as boundary marks numerous traditions associate them with battles fought in these localities and in the popular fancy they are imagined to indicate the favorite haunts of witches the meeting places where they held their revels the horseshoe mark being an imprint of the devil's foot these weird rendezvous were usually on the tops of mountains or hills and are still known as witches dance places in different parts of Europe, especially in Germany. 20. 
recapitulation of theories of the origin of the horseshoe superstition. In the preceding pages, an attempt has been made to furnish plausible reasons for the horseshoe's universal popularity, both as an amulet and as a token of good luck. It is evident, however, that this superstition cannot be referred to any one particular starting point. Just as the sources of a river may be manifold, consisting of numerous springs and tributaries, so too the belief in the horseshoe's magical virtues is of complex origin and can be traced to diverse beginnings. It may be profitable, therefore, briefly to enumerate the different theories which have been advanced. 1. At the rite of the Passover, the blood sprinkled upon the lintel and doorposts form the chief points of an arch, hence the value of arch-shaped talismans. 2. The magical virtue of the horseshoe against witches and fiends has been attributed to its bifurcated form and to its resemblance to the lunar crescent. Charms of similar shape are known to have been in use among the ancient Chaldeans and Egyptians. 3. Iron and steel, metals having traditional power against evil, disposed fairies and goblins. 4. The serpentine shape. Serpent worship was nearly universal among primitive peoples, and amuletic symbols of this form were in use in the days of ancient Rome. 5. The so-called horseshoe arch as typifying a beneficent, protecting power. 6. The ancient conception of the earth as having the shape of a round boat turned upside down and corresponding to the Egyptian put sign. 7. The horse. This animal was worshipped among the early Germanic tribes, and an English myth accredits to it luck-bringing qualities. 8. The Scandinavian superstition of the demon mare. 9. The old astrological principle that Mars, the god of war and the warhorse, was hostile to Saturn, the liege lord of witches. 10. The legend of St. Dunstan and the devil. 11. Phallic symbolism. 12. The aureole or nimbus. 13. Supernatural faculties ascribed to blacksmiths. 14. The Egyptian hieroglyphic symbol signifying the mystical door of life. 15. Horses hoof prints in mythology and tradition. 16. The horseshoe, a symbol of the heathen god Woden. 21. Conclusion. Whatever may be the origin of the superstitious employment of the horseshoe, its adoption as a token of good luck appears to be comparatively modern, its earliest use having been for the exclusion of witches, evil spirits, and all such uncanny beings. Before leaving the subject, an extract may be given from an article in the London World, August 23, 1753, against the repeal of the so-called Witch Act, wherein the writer offers the following satirical advice to whomever it may concern. To secure yourself against the enchantments of witches, especially if you are a person of fashion and have never been taught the Lord's Prayer, the only method I know of is to nail a horseshoe upon the threshold. This I can affirm to be of the greatest efficacy, insomuch that I have taken notice of many a little cottage in the country with a horseshoe at its door, where gaming, extravagance, Jacobitism, and all the catalogue of witchcrafts have been totally unknown. The world moves and civilization progresses, but the old superstitions remain the same. The rusty horseshoe found on the road is still prized as a lucky token, and will doubtless continue to be so prized, for human nature does not change, and superstition is a part of human